Welcome to the ASCAR Group's Cognitive Aid Companion videos. In these short minutes, we hope to give you a pragmatic approach to perioperative hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia can be a life-threatening condition, but as with all things in medicine, the body adapts with chronicity. Consider applying this aid when encountering a serum potassium of over 6 millimoles per litre. Whilst managing the consequences of hyperkalemia, it is equally imperative to establish its etiology. For this topic, it's worth noting we have complementary aids on bradycardia and cardiac arrest, both of which feature hyperkalemia as a cause. First things first, our aid prompts you to repeat a blood sample when you're starting treatment to establish a baseline. An arterial line is a great way to ensure you are not treating a hemolyzed sample and to monitor the potassium and blood sugar. More on this to come. Fluid management is going to be important. You will need an indwelling catheter. As strong proponents of human factors, we love the idea of signaling. Defibrillator pads and a urinary catheter can be great signals to your surgeon and the team of the seriousness of the situation. Step one of pharmacological management begins with stabilizing the myocardium with one gram of calcium chloride or gluconate. This is more important in patients with ECG changes but does not need ECG changes to be given. We have access to calcium chloride, so one gram via large vein is our go-to. This will last approximately 30 minutes and redosing after this time is appropriate and may be done even sooner if ECG changes recur. At this point, it is worth considering if this could be hyperkalemia from digoxin toxicity. If so, the rapid administration of calcium can potentiate fatal arrhythmias and giving it over 20 to 30 minutes will be prudent in this case. Seek expert advice and don't forget Digibind. Step 2. We suggest transiently hyperventilating your patient to induce a respiratory alkalosis and drive potassium ions into the intracellular space. We suggest this as step 2 as for most of us it's an easy manipulation to make. If you have to paralyze the patient here, remember not to use succimethonium. Our third step is to encourage the redistribution of potassium ions into the intracellular compartment and temporize the situation. Common to these methods is that they take at least 20 minutes to work. The options and doses are written here. There are some caveats to be aware of. Be mindful of how you draw up the insulin, as preparation errors are not uncommon. Be mindful of your patient when giving the dose of dextrose. If their blood sugar is already high, for example above 14 millimoles per litre, consider omitting or reducing the dose of dextrose. Remember, insulin is renally excreted, so if your patient has renal dysfunction, you may want to go lower with your dose of insulin. In short, you can't go wrong with frequent blood sugar monitoring here on in. In regards to salbutamol, the doses are larger than the typical asthma nebulizer. 10 to 20 milligrams will bring the potassium down by one millimole per liter. So be cautious in patients with ischemic heart disease and patients with arrhythmias. Conversely, beware that the efficacy will be limited in patients who are beta blocked. And this leads us on to fluid management, perhaps the most nuanced part of the plan. First things first, pause any potassium containing infusions, Hartmann's, packed red blood cells. If blood is necessary, consider asking a perfusionist to help wash it. Be cautious about the potential for normal saline to induce a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis that may potentiate hyperkalemia. At the same time, we want to optimize renal perfusion to assess with potassium excretion. Consider an appropriate mean arterial pressure for the patient. Finally, consider giving furuzamide 20 to 40 milligrams intravenously, particularly to the patient that's hypervolemic. If the patient is acidotic, in addition to hyperventilating the patient, it is worth considering giving bicarbonate to correct the metabolic acidemia. Many guidelines still suggest hypertonic bicarbonate, that is 8.4% given as a bolus of 0.5 to 1 millimole per kilogram, so we have mentioned it here. However, 
Be wary, hypertonic solutions can lead to an increase in serum potassium via the process of solvent drag. Remember, you will also need to adjust your ventilation to blow off the extra carbon dioxide being produced. Hence, one thing we've seen work well in the ICU is isotonic bicarbonate, 1.26%. This can be made up by 150 millimoles of bicarbonate, that is, 1.5 vials of the 8.4% bicarbonate with 1 litre of 5% dextrose. This could be bolused in aliquots to hypovolemic patients or given slowly as your maintenance fluid of choice. Finally, discuss this with your renal team and intensive care unit. Intensive care with continuous renal replacement therapy may be the patient's most appropriate destination and you may want to help out by placing a VASCATH. Also remember, if surgery has to continue, dialysis can even be brought down to the operating theatre. Thank you for listening, and we welcome your feedback.